Hi, I'm Anderson Brown. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Cartesianism. We live in a time, especially amongst philosophers and cognitive studies people, where uh, sort of naturalism is generally accepted or espoused. I certainly am that myself, absolutely not any kind of metaphysical dualist. However, it's interesting to note that a lot of Cartesian assumptions are still running around really in some really vital and central places. So what I want to do today then is to uh, talk about that. I think it's very important. Um, and so let's do that. Let me get this uh, set up here. And there we go. i to do it. Okay, okay, let's go back. All right, Cartesian distortions, the continuing impact of mind-body dualism. And I think uh, if you follow me, uh, we'll have, I think, some reasonable uh, arguments here today that there are still quite a lot of Cartesian distortions and Cartesian thinking running around in a lot of our contemporary philosophy, including a lot of philosophy of mind, uh, consciousness studies, and a lot of philosophy that really take to be sort of uh, first philosophy or central philosophy these days. So let's do take uh, a look at some of these Cartesian distortions in contemporary philosophy, uh, particularly contemporary philosophy of mind, because of course, when we're talking about Cartesianism, talking about a kind of mind-body dualism. Uh, stuck in our heads, sort of, this whole idea of the inner and the outer, I think, is very Cartesian. Let me work through the slide. I'm not just gonna read the slides off verbatim. Uh, sometimes I will, but I wanna stop and expound on some things. Uh, basic stuff here, just talking about Rene Descartes himself, uh, in the first place, beginning of sort of the early modern period in philosophy, Descartes thought that mental substance was metaphysically distinct from material substance. I'm going to be brisk about some of this stuff. I'm talking about a lot of things in this video, so we could go off uh, and, and flesh out and develop any number of these discussions. As I say, I'm just going to mention a lot of things. Uh, well, again, I'm still on the first bullet point. Uh, Descartes thought we couldn't doubt that we were minds, right? I'm, I'm thinking, therefore I am. I know that there's a thinking thing, but we might doubt that we were bodies. And so this was one of his arguments, sort of basically the dubitability, if you will, of the material world and the indubitability of what he took to be the mental. And this whole idea that there's a distinction between the physical and the mental is an assumption of modern Western philosophy and a lot of Eastern philosophy, for example, we don't find that second bullet point. He also thought that God, rather than material nature, was the source of mental contents. Lots of times we think of that in terms of what he meant by the clear and distinct ideas that God gave to us, which by which he meant sort of uh, rational um, cognition, mathematical and logical thinking. But remember, in the meditations, in the uh, discussion of skepticism there, uh, he also raises a problem, we might call it the brain in a vat problem these days, he thought of it as an evil demon problem, that if God, according to Descartes, could put uh, contents into our mind, then there could be some other kind of more malevol malevolent sort of uh, being that had these same uh, abilities that God did to put distorted -ish, uh, ideas into our mind. Of course, Descartes thought that God was no deceiver. Again, that's another argument, uh, another part of Descartes you could look at. The reason for mentioning that, though, in the second bullet point here is that clearly then from that, he thinks that your sort of uh, perceptual field, what you're experiencing as the input from your senses was also something that was ultimately really something that uh, depended on God uh, last bullet point on the slide, as a result of this Cartesian dualism and compounded by the elaborations of Kant in the 18th century. Descartes in his optics uh, says he doesn't literally mean there are little pictures in the head. Descartes is a very good philosopher. Kant's a really good philosopher too. But I mentioned Kant because Kant was the one who really thought, uh, he was really invested in the idea of a representational theory of mind, that the mind is sort of construction, constructing the representation uh, and, and therefore that we don't really have any kind of direct perception of the world. So, so the first Cartesian uh, element here, the big one, is this whole idea of a representational theory of mind, that what we're experiencing is sort of the mind's representation of the world, and that in itself reflects a kind of mind-body dualism, a really profound mind-body dualism, such that we're sort of stuck in our heads. And of course, that representational theory of mind then 
it leads on to uh, skepticism, the skeptical problems that we do identify with Descartes. Uh, first bullet point, baked into the representational theory of mind is this problem about skepticism. If you have a, any kind of representational theory of mind, including, for example, uh, that your, your functional model of, of the nervous system is that it's some kind of information processing system, right? That's a representational theory of mind that somehow the way we represent the world mentally to ourselves might somehow be divergent from the way that the world really is. An easy thing to say, a little bit harder to imagine what exactly someone might have in mind, uh, pardon the pun. In fact, Descartes, as I mentioned before, thought that the perceived world, including our own bodies, could not be proven to exist at all. So again, clearly he uh, has very much this representational theory of mind. And you see, I'm sure how skepticism, as I put it there, is baked into that. Because once you've got a distinction between the outer real world and your inter-representation of the world, there's the question mark about the relationship between the representation and reality. And that's what skepticism is all about. Uh, second bullet point, really important point to understanding early modern philosophy, uh, Descartes and Hume. Cartesian skepticism was aggravated by Descartes' mathematician's definition of certainty. Descartes, a great world-class historical mathematician, and when he was trying to figure out what he could doubt and what he could not doubt, his, uh, his criteria for knowledge, saying that his criterion for knowledge, saying that you know something, he said you have to prove that it's logically necessary. The way you have to prove that the outcome, the last proposition in a mathematical proof, it logically necessarily follows from the starting propositions of the proof. Uh, and in that view, then we could only be said to know, according to Descartes, when we could demonstrate the logical necessity of the proof of a proposition. So last bullet point on the slide then, you know, this is really what David Hume is doing uh, systematically. He's giving us a sustained critique of Descartes' definition of knowledge and showing that we really don't have uh, a proof of the logical necessity of really just about anything that we know. Of course, Hume thinks that what happens is that we are conditioned, which notice is a non-rational process. Uh, he's not a cognitivist about learning. That is, he thinks that we experience regularities and these uh, pronounced regularities of our experience condition us or habituate us to have expectations that the future will be similar to the past. That's Hume. And Hume points out, last sentence on the slide, that we can't, we can't even prove that the sun will rise in the east by logical necessity, that is, we have no logical proof of that or that, the, or that the future will be the same as the past. Uh, Hume's not a skeptic. Uh, that's a common misinterpretation uh, of Hume. I have a, another video about that in this series. Um, uh, that is, again, uh, Cartesian skepticism is the idea that there's some sort of distinction between the representation or possibly a distinction between the representation and the reality. And Hume doesn't endorse anything like that at all. So notice then, and this is just a classical thing uh, in the tradition, that if you've got a representational theory of mind, like the rationalists do, then you're going to have the skeptical problem. That do, but that doesn't mean that the skeptical problem is incorrigible. So language and mind, of course, again, now going further with this sort of rationalist view of the mind, first bullet point, on a sound evolutionary biological perspective, it's trivially true that thinking must precede language. You know, you have, you know, it's, it's an odd thing to think that you couldn't think before you, you had language. What was happening before language evolved? How could language evolve if the thought wasn't already present? A trait as sophisticated as language could only emerge after hominids that already attained a high degree of cognitive development. And I take that to be very much a common sense view that really the benefit, the, the, the burden of proof would be on someone who wanted to deny that. Second bullet point, though, on this slide, Descartes' mind-body dualism reversed this common sense assumption, believing that mental content was not itself a part of contingent physical nature. Remember, Descartes thinks that God is endowing us with these things. And Kant, you know, writing much later, at the end of the 18th century, really can't do much better on the etiology of these things. Um, believing that mental content was not itself a part of contingent physical nature, right, 17th century rationalists could believe that non-linguistic animals had no experiences at all, including phenomenal experiences. This, different, this difference between uh, having intentional contents, beliefs, and desires 
and having phenomenal experiences, feelings and pains and so on, uh, often is glossed over and missed again, because it's another Cartesian problem, because we think that this, uh, this noun, the mind refers to some one thing. And so then we start to think that the phenomenal experiences uh, have the same kind of status as the intentional states, which is incorrect. Mind is a heterogeneous concept. And of course, notoriously, then some of these uh, people like the Port Arthur psychologists in the 1600s would perform live vivisection. They didn't really believe that the screaming animals were really feeling pain. They talked themselves out of it. Again, a bizarre thing to think. But that carries over into the 20th century. Last bullet point on the slide. In the 20th century, the rationalist Noam Chomsky, combating as he saw it, the dehumanizing tendency of behaviorism, and Chomsky came up with a good argument. It's the only good argument against uh, making mental attributions to animals, by the way, uh, that I don't, I don't, I think it's wrong, but it's the only, you know, substantial one. He argued that the grammar of language, we call this generative grammar, uh, that you have syntax and that it is this grammatical structure that enables humans to construct an indefinitely large number of uh, of calls, if you want, whereas a, a non-linguistic animal only has a tropic repertoire of set uh, calls or mental states. Uh, Chomsky argued that the grammar of language is the structure on which mental content was built. And he would even go, I'm not sure that Chomsky after all these years would do this. This was the late 1950s. Um, uh, so he's writing uh, aspects of a theory of syntax. He's publishing that in maybe 1963. Uh, and he would actually say, well, maybe there was some kind of random mutation. That is, he understood that he needed to block the continuity evolutionary argument, which he did not successfully do, I wouldn't say. But, but in any event, this is, you know, he is a rationalist, self-professed, and the argument still is this, that uh, the one that Descartes absolutely endorsed, that uh, you have to have language to be in some of these mental states at all. And then there's an, there's an equivocation between these intentional states and phenomenal experiences as well. It's important to keep in mind. So then, so then one place in content, still today, again, what I'm interested in getting at in this video is the way that there are Cartesian distortions still distorting our philosophical conversation and psychological conversation today. And one of those is certainly around uh, the mental states of non-human animals or non-linguistic animals, where you really see this kind of chauvinistic Cartesianism still just full blown all over the place. First bullet point, mind-body dualism provides a foundation to deny animal mind altogether, obviously. It's, this is a serious disability. This is you know, uh, denying con the continuity thesis, thesis that uh, the mental states of, say, uh, primates have, have a, an evolutionary continuity with, say, the mental states of um, non-primate mammals, for example is a serious disability. Wittgenstein points out, you can just look and see. I'm gonna get back to that locution. You can just look and see. Remember Descartes asked for proof of the logical necessity of things when no such proof was available. And people who say you have to prove that animals have minds. I think, you know, my, my first response to that is always, well, prove that humans have minds because it just gets back to the same problem second bullet point. This often has to do with these dualistic ideas about language. So here's an example. You've got a boy and a dog are chasing a cat and they chase the cat across the lawn and up into the tree. And then the boy and the dog are down at the bottom of the tree and they're looking up into the tree like this, looking for the dog. And we say about them, they believe that the cat, looking for the cat, I'm sorry. And we say about them, they believe that the cat is in the tree. Now, according to this Chomsky argument, uh, that uh, you have to be able to, what's the argument really that you have to be able to form a grammatically well-formed proposition, which is the content of the belief. You believe that, quote, the dog is in the tree, unquote. And if you can't make a proposition like the dog is in the tree, then you just can't be in the intentional state. So on that view, then, when we say that the boy believes that the dog is, in, that the cat, I'm sorry, is up in the tree, we believe something like that, that the boy has a propositional object of their um, of, of, of their belief. It's it's a propositional, they have an attitude because it's the propositional attitudes. Again, I have videos about all this further. But when we talk about the dog, according to this rationalist argument about language and mind, then 
we don't mean that at all. We don't mean that we can't, the dog doesn't have any beliefs at all, actually, because on this view, if you can't make a well-formed proposition to be the content of the intentional state, then you can't have beliefs or hopes or fears or desires or expectations and so on. I would point out for one thing, because I think that philosophy doesn't so much aim at solving problems as just gaining understanding that you know, we we really don't talk like that. I mean, when when most people say that the dog believes the cat is in the tree, they really mean to be saying exactly the same thing as what the, the dog, the, the the boy believes that the cat is in the tree. And this is Hume's point that that perfectly rational isn't exactly the same thing as reasonable. I mean, it, it looks like the datum is that we say the same thing about the boy and the dog, and that's what needs to be explained, as Hume says at the outset of his treatise. Last bullet point, then, this is a rhetorical point, but one that you're going to write into a lot talking about the minds of uh, non-human animals, is anthropocentrism motivated by this dualism, by this Cartesian dualism that leads to the misapprehension that's anthropomorphic. People say, oh, well, you're just being anthropomorphic. You're projecting human thought onto non-human animals. But in order to think that, to think that, to, that that's an example of projection, and then to say, well, then that's a, a, an error of anthropomorphism. You have to be anthropocentric. You have to assume already that it's only humans that have these kinds of mental experiences, which is just, again, it's something you would only think if you were in the grip of some kind of mind-body dualism. Okay, but now we'll move on to some other philosophical issues besides these. The free will versus determinism debate. For example, we have a, uh, a resurgence now, you'll see it on social media, of people who want to claim that to be a naturalist, to be a physicalist, as I am, I'm a naturalist, yeah. okay. That to be a person like that means that you have to accept that determinism, that people are determined and empiricist philosophers, and I'm in the empiricist tradition, I'm very much an empiricist philosopher, have always tended to say, and I understand why they say, and they're not wrong on some level, that you know, uh, there isn't anything by free will, if you mean by free will, some exception to the causal order. You know, I think that's right. However, uh, this uh, current sort of surge of people arguing that determinism means that we're not really responsible when we could not have acted otherwise for any given intentional action that we commit is uh, very much in the grip of a Cartesian distortion and a misunderstanding of this. First bullet point. The metaphysical pseudo problem of free will versus determinism. It's a pseudo problem. It's supposed to be a problem in metaphysics, right? It's an essential example of Cartesian delusion with everyone involved on both sides making the same mistake. The libertarian and the determinist just make the same mistake. They have the same position. They just have two, you know, opposite interpretations of it. They're exactly the same. Second bullet point. The libertarian assumes, and this is why empiricists aren't too, you know, particularly interested in this line. That a human being must have some extra physical ability to countervene the causal antecedents li leading up to their action. In other words, again, it looks, it's a, it looks like mind-body dualism, right? You can easily label the libertarian as a mind-body dualist in the sense it looks like they're claiming that the human mind is some kind of miracle in as much as it looks they want to at least strongly imply that the reason that you could uh, be said to have the possibility of having acted otherwise or chosen otherwise for any given, given choice or action is because somehow there's a mysterious occult power that the mind has to contravene uh, the laws of nature. That's why the determinist crowd makes their mistake because they say, oh, well, that's, that's, a, that's a bad mistake. So therefore the alternative is determinism, okay? But last bullet point, the determinist makes the exact same mistake. They too assume that the human self or mind is in nature, but not of it, right? See that? that, oh, well, then if, uh, if I don't have a sort of magical mind that can countervene the laws of nature, then it must be that my what? My Cartesian soul that's different from the world or the rest of the world is being swept along by determinants um, such that humans come under natural nomological causation. They cannot be said to be making choice, choices. Again, it's just the same mistake that I'm somehow not actually part of nature because they have a Cartesian soul. Of course, the naturals will say, oh, I'm not thinking anything like that. But that's exactly what they are thinking, or else you can't motivate the supposed problem of determinism. You can't say that I'm not responsible for my choices. Uh, you can't say that if you think that I'm integrated wholly with the rest of nature. Obviously, this new neo-determinist crowd 
does not think that. And why not? Because they're in the grip of Cartesian distortions. And then the last sentence on the slide, in addition to that, determinism is also an example of Cartesian skepticism. And the, the philosophical skeptic tells us that we're not certain of something. We're absolutely certain that we do know. And so the typical, again, Humean, for example, critiques of skepticism come into play there. Free will versus determinism, a pseudo debate, a pseudo problem. I'm not a compatibilist notice because I think both libertarianism and determinism are mistaken. That is, I reject them both. So whatever my position is, it's not a compatibilist position. So let's move on. The myriological fallacy. This is another one that's just all over the place on social media. Uh, you know, maybe this video about the reason for making it is because you get so maddened by all this, uh, all this confusion. The myriological fallacy is the fallacy confusing the parts or some of the parts for the whole. And this fallacy is absolutely ubiquitous in discussions of consciousness. All these consciousness studies people are making this problem all the time. Brains and brain function, AI, uh, deep language learning models. It's also there in personal identity. I'm not going to go to personal identity in this video. It's all another thing. All of this owing to these Cartesian assumptions. For example, second bullet point, people who think of themselves as naturalists or physicalists or whatever, they're, you know, they're little mini, mini theories, right? Naturalism that only nature exists, materialism that only matter exists, physicalism that only the physical exists. Uh, there, you know, you, we could pick nits between them, but it's it's monism, I think, really. And again, I'm all for it. I think that the, the real point there is a monist ontology rather than a dualist one whatever little ism you attach to it. But people who think of themselves as naturalists, as thoroughly modern naturalists, like I am, will nonetheless insist that they are their brains. The brain is now the little homunculus. Before it was the Cartesian soul. It was the Cartesian soul that was living its life through this vehicle of the body. And what these so-called naturalists do is just swap out the Cartesian soul for the brain which sounds naturalist because the brain is the physical organ of the body, right? And so they don't see the mistake that they're making. The Cartesian soul has simply been swapped out for the brain. Now the brain is a little homunculus. Oh, I'm really just my brain. I'm such a hard headed, you know, materialist that I understand that I'm really just my brain. Nonsense, this is a really bad mistake. So let's get to the right way of looking at things in the third bullet point, the last bullet point on the slide. In fact, intentional ascriptions, intentional attributions, predicates. You say of someone that they have a belief, a desire, a hope, a fear, and so on. Intentional description with those with that vocabulary. These are made of whole persons, whole persons, a whole body. Brains, listen, listen to this. Brains don't think. They don't learn. They don't produce or comprehend speech. They don't solve problems or make decisions. We can identify parts, areas of the brain, Broca's area and Vern, Vern, uh, the Wernicke area about language, for example. But, you know, again, that, that, that doesn't mean that's the part, that's the little part that's conscious, that's thinking. Whole persons think and learn and solve problems and recognize patterns and worry and plan. This Cartesian mistake is a serious problem for neuroscience and cognitive studies in general impeding as it does obviously understanding of actual brain function if you think that the brain is an is a little person in your head which which explains nothing by the way you've just pushed the problem back a step it's like thinking that you solve problems by positing a god you know you have to now you have to explain that it doesn't do any explaining at all actually to say that the brain is a little person in your head we want to understand the little person in the first place and now you've just now you have a, a regression to just another little person uh, but this is a good example of where philosophy actually makes a difference um, because think of your setting up laboratory paradigms. If you think, if you endorse the representational theory of mind, you're going to uh, set up certain kinds of experiments. And if you think that might be wrong, you're going to design other kinds of experiments. So here's a case where philosophy is still vital. These are sort of metaphysical questions that we're thinking here, but they're thinking about here, but they certainly do have a bearing on, on real research. And again, you know, you're not your brain, okay? You're your body. That's that's real naturalism. That's real physicalism. 
uh, thinking that your your brain is just uh, some half baked Cartesianism. You're still making the error. You're still committing the mirological fallacy. Let's move on. Uh, then we, of course, you know the other big issue, even bigger issue, is all this talk about AI and language learning models and chatbots and all that. And again, of course, I do have a video on chatbots in the series. The current discussion of AI and chatbots is rife with Cartesian distortions. The chatbots are going to take over the world. Uh, they're in love with me. They want to marry me. They think I should commit suicide. You know, all this kind of wild stuff about the chatbots are going to take over. It's the nerd apocalypse or whatever the heck people call that. Really silly. The basic mistake, as with discussions of the brain, is to confuse the CPU, the central processing unit, with the whole Right, just someone's looks like someone's making a mistake when they think the brain is a little person in the head. For example, many people assume that artifactual consciousness, by the way, there's no artificial intelligence. That's like artificial music. If it sounds like music, it is. It's intelligence, it is. The right phrase is artifactual intelligence. And again, as I've pointed out already, there's a difference between intelligence and consciousness. Although as a materialist, I do think that artifactual consciousness is possible since I think that I'm a physical being. So if another physical being had all the relevantly similar physical properties, it too would be consciousness. However, many people in the grip of Cartesian distortions think that artifact, artifactual consciousness would be a function of programming, right? It's going to be the computers, but it could only be achieved through robotics. Why is that? Because for me to be conscious, I have to have these millions of nerve endings all over my body and all of my extremely sophisticated and evolved sense organs and sensory systems. And that is what would have to be duplicated to get a being that had the property of being conscious. Intelligence, something else. Second bullet point, consciousness. For example, the feeling of your feet in your shoes right now. Feel your feet or maybe you're barefoot, doesn't matter. Feel your, your feet. Uh, that's what consciousness is. It's a property of certain exquisitely organized whole bodies. It's not a representation. It's not, you know, uh, a projection. It's the way your feet feel, the, the actual feet. Consciousness is a property of your body, including your feet. A human has a powerful neural net device in their head. That's their brain. Really useful. Really couldn't get by without it but it's not a person within a person. It's just a neural net device, like the ones that they have in connectionist computers, which aren't conscious at all. Okay, last bullet point. Machines, as they stand at this point, again, remember, uh, have no, and they're not designed to have any phenomenal experiences at all. There's a metal box. Therefore, they fail to refer. What does that mean? This is John Searle's argument. I think it's right. Uh, when I uh, say table, or when I say orange, okay, and you understand what I mean, we're conscious beings. What does it mean to say that I understand what the symbol orange means? Well, that fruit, the one that has that color and that feels like that when you open it up and tastes like that when you put it in your mouth with that juice that it has. Now, that's what a computer doesn't have. Uh, they, and that's what I mean when I say they don't refer. They don't refer to anything. And it's thinking that they refer is when you start to get into all the crazy stuff about how they want to take over the world and they want to marry your daughter and all that ridiculous stuff. Uh, they fail to refer and intentional attributions to them are then delusional, okay? Because intentional predicates assume that you're talking about a being that actually knows what it's talking about. And a non-conscious artifact does not. Conscious artifact is a theoretical possibility, but we don't have any. Onward. Mind and life, you know, uh, a debilitating consequence of modern Cartesianism, the idea that the mind is just something completely different from the body. Still internalized, we're not there yet. Like Nietzsche, who understood a lot about this, for example, that, you know, you have to see that you're part of nature, you're, you know, you're not something separate from nature. He said, it's going to take a really long time for people to work through this. A debilitating consequence of modern Cartesianism is the conceptual separation of the concepts of mind and life. So we have disembodied minds floating around, ghosts and, uh, you know, minds or souls existing after the death of the body and all the rest of that. And computers having minds. But organismic life is the key to functionalist accounts of minds, transcendental uh, um, descriptions of minds. 
both Aristotle and Wittgenstein understood this. You know, um, I recommend you to these two philosophers who are, you know, much, much greater, much greater philosophers than myself. But let's look at the two bullet points. Aristotle describes the soul. Psyche. Aristotle thinks of psyche as anything that's sort of causing movement from within. He thinks that plants have psyche when they grow, reproduce, turn their leaves to the sun, and so on. He is, this is Dianima, that's his text on the soul. Uh, he is a very strict uh, continuity theorist, as he should be, because that's the right position. Uh, and he describes substance as a unity of form and matter. Primary being is substance, the unity of form and matter. He takes the two uh, cardinal examples of that to be organisms and artifacts because they come under this functional paradigm. Uh, primary being is a mix of form and matter. This form, what he means by the form is not some form in platonic heaven, you know, not the, not the cookie cutter, but rather the process or life cycle of the organism is the form. In the book, in his book, The Physics, where he, where he develops all of this, he's, he's trying to explain change, why change happens in the world. And that's the formal property that the world has of being involved in a teleological process. The telos, the goal or the purpose of the behavior, whether you're talking about a mental trade or a physical trade, again, Aristotle doesn't have this distinction between the mental and the physical, as a lot of Asian philosophy also does not is what makes the behavior intelligible and so intelligent. You only know what a heart is when you understand it's a pump. That's the answer to the what is it. And when you're talking about thinking and cognitive processes as well, exactly the same thing holds true. You've got to know the reason why that's happening. That's the what is it of the thing, the thing that it's doing. Last bullet point, Wittgenstein also argues that a being with, with a particular form of life in a particular environment will have particular traits and practices, traits and practices unique to it. I, he, he tries to apply this to mathematics. I think mathematics is a bit of a problem for empiricism, but in any event, another separate topic. Uh, the point here is that there is no generic mind separate from bodies. The sort of God's eye or transcendental Cartesian notion of the mind implies that the mind is something that's only sort of roughly connected with a specific physical body. Aristotle and Wittgenstein both think that what you mean by this word mind, M-I-N-D, is just a property of this living body. Uh, functional role semantics replaces Cartesian representational accounts of meaning. <laughs> that is, rather than all the speech acts being uh, either correctly or incorrectly lined up with the a priori meaning of that particular proposition, rather a nominalist view that what we're calling the meaning of the proposition is the aggregate of all the uses, all the different speech acts, acts that have been uh, committed. And I, again, have a video on nominalism in the sequence. So uh, this, uh, this separation of mind from life that's a consequence of this sort of Cartesian disembodied theory of the mind is still very much rife. And it's really a shame because it really impoverishes a lot of philosophy of mind. Last bullet point, maybe, I don't know, maybe the most provocative one. The hard problem is a pseudo problem. There is no problem about consciousness. Okay, ah, provocative thing to say, let's work through it. There is no hard problem of consciousness. If this is understood as say, for example, understanding how the brain causes or gives rise to phenomenal consciousness, is it a certain frequently frequency of megahertz, you know, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, as the brain standing in for the Cartesian soul does no such thing. It doesn't cause or give rise to consciousness. What does? Your body. Consciousness is a property of certain bodies that are highly sensitive and reactive to their environments. The difference between paramecia and humans in this regard is quantitative. Cartesian anthropocentrism makes this hard for many people to countenance. People really don't like that. They really don't like your reductive deflationary view of the mind, but that's the only kind of view that actually makes any sense if you're an actual uh, naturalist, if you're an actual empiricist. Okay. Um, and then the last bullet point, and there's just a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, I would recommend, I, I believe we find these arguments in Hume. We find them in Wittgenstein, and I also uh, mentioned this a couple of times. I think these are also the arguments that we find in Buddhism, like in Mahayana, like Nagarjuna or Dogen. 
uh, last bullet point, I'll just go through it. Phenomenal properties are constitutive of the subjective experience of consciousness beings. Uh, as Wittgenstein says, uh, at, actually at the end of the Tractatus, the world and I are one. That is, you have, uh, I, I, am the, I am my world, the microcosm. Again, that's Wittgenstein. Uh, you, you are at the center of what you could call a world. It's the world that is your phenomenal experience that came into existence when you became conscious and that will disappear when you lose consciousness. A big, big part of this so-called problem with the hard problem is an equivocation between that world, the world that's just the world of your, your body having experiences of its environment and the common world and the ideas that we have to fit. We have to somehow have an account of consciousness as a phenomenon, as a phenomenon in this common world. This is Thomas Nagel's uh, mistake, I think, in the view from nowhere, although it's very much worth reading. Um, phenomenal properties are constitutive of the subjective experience of conscious being. And the problem is really with our notion of language and science, not with our notion of consciousness, I think. Language and science describe and explain the extra subjective common world. You can, you know, we have, we know the common world through these linguistic artifacts. You can read about it in physics books and chemistry books and geology books, also history books and novels. Um, but the common world is not the object of phenomenal experience. Okay. And Berkeley and Hume are clear on this. You know, there's this, the, the, the common world that we all share is not an experienced world. Last sentence. The myth of the hard problem is based on a misunderstanding of language and science, their functions and their limits. You can't put in words what it's like to taste the spaghetti sauce or to see the color blue. And so it's not science's job to put that kind of thing in words. All right. So uh, let me uh, step out here. Uh, what I've done then is give a bit of a survey of some of the ways that lingering Cartesian assumptions are really still distorting a lot of our discussions in philosophy of mind, notably, again, about consciousness, about AI, about free will and determinism, about mental representation. And these are, this is a big deal, you know, and when you look at the extent of the mistakes and the extent of the misunderstandings and how much, you know, fire and smoke and sound and fury and verbiage there is around, like these, the, like these people who say that, oh, well, we have to give up on the idea of responsibility because they have sort of a uh, vintage Newton, you know, 1689 notion of, you know, what sort of the causal order is like, uh, you know, we really have a lot of work to do. So I just thought I'd, uh, I'd share that with you. Uh, maybe this time around, uh, not uh, bothering to not be uh, provocative. I really usually try and avoid any kind of confrontation, <laughs> but I guess I've been, uh, but I guess I've been pushed a little too far on some of this. So, all right. So a little precis of uh, Cartesian distors distortions in the contemporary discussion of the mind-body problem. And I thank you very much if you come this far and listen to what I have to say. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.